Hey there, friends, it's Lucifer Means Lightbringer. In one of my last videos, Symbolism of the Others, Kingsguard, we saw how the White Knights of the Kingsguard are described with all the same descriptive language as the White Walkers of the Wood, being white shadows armored in ice and snow and ghostly pale moonlight and all the rest, and how this enables them to serve as symbolic stand-ins for the Others. The first implication of this seems to be that the Others were created in part as a kind of Kingsguard for some sort of royalty king or a queen of the others. We began our attempt to explore what this means in Origin of the Others, Knight's Queen, where I made the case that Knight's King and Queen were in fact the ones who created the others during the Long Night and led their invasion of Westeros. I feel pretty solid about that, and I hope you do too, lest we fall through the ice and drown, only to have our corpses hauled out of the ice lake by Night King's mysterious icy chains and turned into an ice dragon. Ice chain pure water. Ice, ice, ice. So let's say that I'm not crazy here, and Night's King did indeed father the others with Night's Queen, who was some sort of magical, ice-transformed woman, kind of like Melisandre, but cold. I mentioned last time that Melisandre's shadow beings are actually shadow clones of King Stannis, and that the others appear to be clones as well, since the six of them that we see in the Game of Thrones prologue are named as twins to one another. The clear implication here is that the original others would have been shadow clones of Night's King, made from his seed and soul which he gave to Night's Queen. And this brings us to today's big question. Who was Night's King? Who was this person from whom the others were cloned? We've got a lot to cover today, so I'll just keep this brief. Click all the buttons, like, subscribe, share, yada yada, sign up for Patreon, paypal.me slash mythicalastronomy for a one-time donation. Thanks to all the Patreons, thanks to George R. Martin, thanks to Stanley Black for writing the Promised Land intro theme music, and thanks to myself for all the other spooky music that plays during the videos. All right, so who was Night's King, right? That's the question. Well, let's go back to the Kingsguard as symbolic proxies for the others. Who created the Kingsguard? Who did the Kingsguard guard for almost all of their history? The answer is dragons. It be dragons, boy. That's right, the other like Kingsguard was created by the dragon kings and queens to guard the dragon kings and queens and their dragon spawn as well. Try to picture the throne room of the Red Keep as the people of Westeros would have seen it for nearly three centuries. A dragon king and queen, dressed in black, surrounded by white shadow knights with armor like ice and snowy cloaks swirling about them. Knight's King was said to be a man of the Night's Watch at first, which puts him in black, and of course the very name Knight's King implies darkness and shadow. The picture fits pretty well, doesn't it? Suddenly the throne room of King's Landing looks a little bit like the Heart of Winter. Thus, we can see that one of the main purposes of our author choosing to dress the Kingsguard in the exact same symbolic language of the others may be to imply that their creator, Knight's King, was a Dragon King. I'll say it another way. There's really no way that George R. R. Martin created this vivid, detailed, symbolic parallel between the Kingsguard and the others if he didn't want us to compare Knight's King and Queen to the Dragon Kings and Queens who made the Kingsguard. In another video in this series, we'll actually take a detailed look at Aegon and Visenya, the dragons they rode, and the things they did as symbolic parallels to Knight's King and Queen business. But today we're going to just start with the basic idea of the others descending from a blood of the dragon person. I'll just go ahead and cut to the chase and tell you that this dragon king who made the others can be none other than Azor Ahai himself, and I'm not the first person to suggest this. Anyone who's listened to my older podcast knows I've held this belief for a long time, and of course Grey Area has done a fantastic video about this, and I actually remember the idea being bandied about the old Westeros.org forums in the days of yore. There's a ton of evidence for this theory, lots more than can fit in one video, so check out the Moons of Ice and Fire podcast series, but let's go ahead and start with the stand and Melisandre parallel to Knight's King and Queen that we laid out in the Origins of the Others video. It should be obvious that Stannis is playing into the Azor Ahai archetype. He may not be the real Azor Ahai reborn like Jon or Danny, but like Beric Dondarrion, Blood Raven, Euron, and many characters from the past such as Daemon Targaryen or the Red Kraken Dalton Greyjoy, Stannis is wearing the symbolism of Azor Ahai, if you will. He's doing Azor Ahai things, and therefore we can say that he's manifesting the archetype, very like the way the Kingsguard are manifesting the archetype of the others. This is one of the primary ways that George uses symbolism to feed us clues about those delicious secret things, so it's important to understand how this works. Stannis is manifesting the Azor Ahai archetype by, well, waving around a flaming sword he calls Lightbringer, by worshipping the god of fire, 
by showing a willingness to commit human sacrifice to try to gain magical weapons, by being concerned with rallying and strengthening the Night's Watch and manning their castles to get ready to fight the others, and last but not least, by calling himself Azor a High Reborn. Even the fiery heart on his sigil calls to mind the heart of Nissa Nissa, set on fire when Azor Ahai tempered Lightbringer in her living heart. Crucially, Stannis is also implied as a kind of honorary dragon king. He makes his home on Dragonstone, ancestral seat of House Targaryen. He's trying everything he can to wake a dragon from stone or anywhere else. And he and Robert kinda sorta use their Targaryen grandmother to aid their claim to the throne. Put it this way, Stannis has at least more dragon blood than brown Ben Plum, alright? So Stannis is basically cosplaying Azor Ahai as a dragon lord. But on the other hand, Stannis is also doing Night's King things. It starts with him giving his seed and soul to Melisandre to make magical shadow children in a process that parallels Night's King and Queen creating the others, as we discussed last time. But it continues with, well, this. The Night Fort is the largest and oldest of the castles on the wall, the king said. That is where I intend to make my seat whilst I fight this war. Azor Ahai, King of the Night Fort, everyone. First it was Azor Ahai, Father of Shadows, now it's Azor Ahai, King of the Night Fort. Stannis is specifically, according to some, a rebel king taking the Night Fort as his seat, which is a great match to Night's King being a rebel king at the Night Fort. Night's King was Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, and although Stannis isn't, yet anyway, some do think he could end up that, Stannis does come to the Wall and start telling the Watch what to do and taking over and manning some of their castles as if he was the Lord Commander. Stannis even leads his army south to enforce his claim over Westeros, just like a Night's King leading the others down from the north to invade Westeros. More specifically, Stannis is starting that campaign by attacking Winterfell. And one thing that most of us think the books and the show will end up having in common is a major showdown with the White Walkers at Winterfell, right? I mean, it probably happened in the past, and it'll probably happen in the future. And we can find another Stannis Night's King correlation in the part of the Night's King legend where he was thrown down by a combination of a Stark of Winterfell and a King Beyond the Wall, because Stannis has warred against those exact same two forces first defeating the King Beyond the Wall, Mance Raider, at the Wall. And as of the end of A Dance with Dragons, Stannis is headed down to war against the Boltons, who have claimed the title of Lord of Winterfell. Heck, Mance Raider is still hanging out in Winterfell, so maybe he'll run into Stannis before it's all said and done and they can talk symbolism. Stannis has also warred against his brother, Renly, which is another sort of shadow match to the Night's King, being thrown down by Brandon the Breaker Stark, who was supposedly his brother, and we'll talk more about that later. As for using sorcery to win friends and influence people, if you remember, Night's King was said to bind his brothers to his will with strange sorceries, Stannis actually does do that, albeit indirectly. Stannis is well known for using the power of Melisandre's sorcery to command fear and respect from both his subjects and his enemies. And though he's not exactly bewitching anyone or controlling anyone's minds, he is sort of dazzling and mesmerizing with his use of sorcery and ritual. This is a good thematic parallel, if nothing else. But it's also possible that Night's King didn't actually hypnotize anyone either, but just instead commanded fear and respect by virtue of his demonstration of magic and sorcery. Now if we have a look at the symbolic language used to describe Stannis the first time we see him on the page, well, 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 just have a look at this. Though he was not yet five and thirty, only a fringe of thin black hair remained on his head, circling behind his ears like the shadow of a crown. Alright, a shadow crown. What is he, some sort of king of shadows? King of night? The passage continues. Stannis kept his own whiskers cropped tight and short. They lay like a blue-black shadow across his square jaw and the bony hollows of his cheeks. His eyes were open wounds beneath his heavy brows, a blue as dark as the sea by night. A blue-black shadow and blue eyes as dark as a sea by night? I mean, it's just descriptive language, but why is George evoking so much night, darkness, and shadow when describing Stannis? His eyes are open wounds, as if he were undead, and he's gaunt to the point of skeletal as well, having bony hollows in his cheeks and leathery skin like steel in another line I didn't quote here. This corpse-like appearance only gets more exaggerated after he spawns a shadow or two, such as when the sight of him shocks Davos in a storm of swords. He had never been a fleshy man, but now the bones moved beneath his skin like spears, fighting to cut free. Even his crown seemed too large for his head, 
His eyes were blue pits lost in deep hollows, and the shape of a skull could be seen beneath his face. A blue-black, shadowy skeleton king with blue eyes of night, who spawns shadows and takes the night fort as his seat, who leads armies down on Westeros from the north. Are you catching the drift here? Notice that it is specifically Stannis giving his seed to his Witch Queen that is transforming him. Along the same lines, I suspect Night's King was transformed in some way as he gave his seed and soul to the magical and icy Night's Queen. The stark juxtaposition of Azor High and Night's King ideas, which defines Stannis symbolism, also makes an appearance when Daenerys catches a glimpse of Stannis in her House of the Undying Vision. Glowing like a sunset, a red sword was raised in the hand of a blue-eyed king who cast no shadow. Stannis no longer casts a shadow in this vision because he's made so many shadow babies and his life fires now burn low. The glowing red sword is an unmistakable reference to Lightbringer, of course. Sunset makes sense as a reference to the Long Night, when Lightbringer, Azor High, and, according to me, Night's King existed, and the blue eyes thing refers to, what, Stannis's natural eye color? That's the other detail that's so important about Stannis that it manifests in the dream realm? No, of course not. Blue eyes are the signature mark of the others. Now, perhaps Stannis will eventually be whited and get actual blue star eyes, but I think what's going on here is that George is giving us the picture of the joint Azor Ahai Night's King archetype, especially since all of Stannis' symbolism seems singularly dedicated to showing us an Azor Ahai person turning into a Night's King person. A blue-eyed king with a red sword who comes out at sunset and whose shadows have been peeled away to make demon warriors. That's our Night's King Azor Ahai, I believe. As I alluded to last time, Stannis isn't the only one who combines Azor Ahai and Night's King symbolism. Jon Snow, Euron Crow's Eye, Aegon the Conqueror, and several other characters do it as well. That's the magic of using symbolic archetypes as George does. All we the reader have to do is put all the figures corresponding to a given archetype in a pile and then sort of just compare them to one another, and the commonalities begin to emerge right away. All of our Knights King Azor High figures will paint a similar symbolic picture, and that's how we can feel confident about drawing a few conclusions from such analysis. For the remainder of this video, we shall consider Jon Snow, since he, along with Daenerys, is the most obvious Azor High reborn person in the story. Danny has already checked pretty much all the prophetic boxes, and although John hasn't yet, I expect John's resurrection to complete the picture for him. Even still, we already have two major indicators that John is in fact Azor Ahai reborn in some very real sense, completely separate and apart from his R plus L equals J bloodline and the prince that was promised prophecy. The first one is the fact that Melisandre has begun to see John when she asks the flames for a glimpse of Azor Ahai reborn. What do you see, my lady? The boy asked softly. Skulls, a thousand skulls, and the bastard boy again, Jon Snow. I pray for a glimpse of Azor Ahai, and R'hllor shows me only snow. The capital S, Snow, and the reference to Jon a couple lines earlier makes it clear. Mel is focusing her intent on seeing, quote, Azor Ahai reborn in her flames, expecting to see Stannis, but she's seeing Jon Snow instead. By the time Melisandre helps resurrect Jon, or maybe helps put his spirit back in his body, she'll have figured this out, I would guess, but right now it's still perplexing her. Now if Jon does at some point become powered by R'hllor TM, then Jon should be able to light his own sword on fire with his own blood, just like Beric does. I do love pointing that out. You don't actually need to kill anyone to make a flaming sword, you just need to be powered by R'hllor. Think about the simple idea of an Azor Ahai person with the name Snow kind of hints at the Azor Ahai Night's King thing too, doesn't it? Jon is kind of like a snowy, cold version of Azor Ahai. I'll also point out that the name Jon Snow roughly translates to Jack Frost, since Jack is a nickname for Jon and Frost and Snow are very similar. Just to jog your memory, Wikipedia describes the figure of Jack Frost as a personification of frost, ice, snow, sleet, winter, and freezing cold. He is a variant of Old Man Winter who was held responsible for frosty weather, nipping the fingers and toes in such weather. So John is somehow that guy, but also Azor Ahai reborn? You begin to see what I mean about John having a similar, frozen Azor Ahai symbolism to Stannis. Think also of Bran's coma dream from back in A Game of Thrones, where he sees 
His bastard brother John, sleeping alone in a cold bed, his skin growing pale and hard as the memory of all warmth fled from him. True, life at the wall is very cold, but might not this line be foreshadowing even more cold transformation for John? It's definitely foreshadowing for his becoming a cold corpse at the end of A Dance with Dragons, and remember when he died, he never felt the fourth knife, only the cold. But I've also suggested many times that John could be temporarily resurrected by the ice magic of the Others before Melisandre gets involved. That's the John becomes the leader of the Others for a time scenario, basically. So it's possible that John's body will literally be covered in ice and frost. And then there's the fact that the other big clue about John being Azor High Reborn, his dream of defending the wall with a burning red sword, dresses him up in ice armor like an other. It's a pretty good match to that vision of Stannis as a blue-eyed king with a red sword that glows like sunset, in that it's implying an otherized, frozen Azor High. Burning shafts hissed upward, trailing tongues of fire. Scarecrow brothers tumbled down, black cloaks ablaze. Snow, an eagle cried, as foemen scuttled up the ice like spiders. John was armored in black ice, but his blade burned red in his fist. As the dead men reached the top of the wall, he sent them down to die again. He slew a graybeard and a beardless boy, a giant, a gaunt man with filed teeth, a girl with thick red hair. Too late, he recognized Ygritte. She was gone as quick as she'd appeared. The world dissolved into a red mist. John stabbed and slashed and cut. He hacked down Donald Noy and gutted Death Dick Follard. Corn half hand stumbled to his knees, trying in vain to staunch the flow of blood from his neck. I am the Lord of Winterfell! John screamed. It was Rob before him now, his hair wet with melting snow. Longclaw took his head off. So here it is, John's big Azor High reborn dream. His sword burns red just as Lightbringer was said to burn red, so that's hard to miss. You'll notice that John's internalized guilt for Ygritte's death manifests itself here in John's nightmare as him killing her with his flaming red sword, which is a clear echo of Azor Ahai killing Nissa Nissa with Lightbringer. As I've pointed out, the fact that Azor Ahai murders his wife is actually a big clue that he isn't the hero that he's cracked up to be, even before he turned into Night's King, if that's what he did. So check out the Azor Ahai the Bad Guy video for more on that. But the point here is that John dreaming of killing Ygritte, his true love, with the burning red sword, very much helps to nail down this sequence as a depiction of the famous deeds of Azor Ahai. John doesn't kill Ygritte in real life. He'd never kill his girlfriend in real life. I mean, that's, that's just ridiculous. Uh, uh. But John does feel responsible, and he does find her as she lies dying with the Night's Watch arrow through her chest, in yet another echo of Nissa Nissa's death by a Lightbringer wound to the chest. Notably, Lightbringer wielding John is defending the wall against the forces of the others here. Living dead men who need to die again, and foes who scuttle up the ice like spiders. A line clearly meant to evoke the idea of ice spiders scuttling up the wall, which, by the way, yikes. Can you even imagine st standing on top of the wall and peering over the edge of there's big ice spiders climbing up the side of you? Anyway, defending the wall against the forces of the others is what John thinks Azor Ahai Reborn is supposed to do, and even with my heretical idea that Azor Ahai became Knight's King, leader of the others, I am suggesting that his brother, son, or perhaps nephew became the last hero who led the watch against the others with his own magic sword of Dragonsteel, so it's very much a cyclical family affair with magic swords to go around. I've even referred to the Azor Ahai archetype as being split in two, the Night's King version is the villainous half, think of Euron Greyjoy here, and the last hero side of things is the heroic form of Azor Ahai. Point being, the part of Jon's dream that has him defending the wall with a burning red sword, later named in the dream as the Valyrian steel sword Longclaw, correlates to the last hero version of the flaming sword hero archetype. Another specific last hero correlation for John can be found in the fact that John starts off the dream by realizing that he's all alone against the forces of the others, just as the last hero's companions all died and left him to flee the others on his own. John's not totally alone, though, as those scarecrow knights that the Watch made in the fight against Mance Raider make an appearance in John's dream. But those scarecrow knights ended up being named after the Black Brothers who died in the fight, so this is actually just another way of implying John as the last hero whose companions have all died. All in all, John is hitting both Azor High and Last Hero Beats in this dream. 
but he's very conspicuously sporting that ice armor as his blade burns red. And of course, ice armor is one of the defining characteristics of the others. Talk about his body growing cold and hard. You'll also notice that John kills his brother Rob with his red sword, and the Night's King was said to have been cast down in part by Brandon the Breaker Stark, who was Night's King's brother, according to some versions of the story. Think about this parallel here. Night's King was supposedly Lord Commander of the Watch, while his brother was the King of Winter or King of the North, just as Rob was King of the North right before John became Lord Commander of the Watch. So John fighting Rob in this dream is a pretty good parallel. You'll also notice that this dream, I guess we should really call it a nightmare, has John slaying other members of the Watch, his friends like Def Dick Follard, Donald Noy, and Corrin Halfhand. This, to me, suggests an evil Lord Commander who has turned against the vows of the Watch and is now fighting against the Watch, as Night's King would have been. Now, getting back to John's ice armor and thinking about it in terms of symbolism, you'll notice that it is specifically black ice armor, as opposed to the white and pale look of the others and their ice. That could be a reference to Night's King as a black brother of the Watch, who became armored in ice, so he's got black ice. But there's also another possibility that's interesting, too. The Stark Ancestral Valerian Steel Sword is, of course, called ice, and it's actually so dark gray as to look black. For example, Ned's ancestor Barth Blacksword got his nickname because he carried ice. Thus, Ned's sword can be thought of as Black Ice. And by extension, John's Black Ice armor might be suggesting Valerian Steel armor, which would be a very good thing to have while fighting the others with a flaming sword. Euron actually has a suit of Valerian Steel armor. Maybe John can hit him up to borrow it. Or maybe John can just hit him in the face and take it and wear it. That'd probably be better. So, just like Stannis is a blue-eyed, shadow-making king with a burning red sword, Jon Snow in this dream is combining obvious symbols of the Others and Night's King with symbols of Azor Ahai. He's doing it all at the Wall, too, which is where Azor Ahai would have found Night's Queen, made the Others, and declared himself Night's King. Now, stepping out of the realm of symbolic analysis and back into regular plot analysis, I can't help but notice that John is kind of a rebel lord commander who has broken almost all of the Night's Watch oaths in one form or another. According to wildling custom, he actually did marry Ygrit by stealing her, quote-unquote, and sleeping with her, which is both a sort of kind of breaking of his vows and an echo of Night's King finding a wife beyond the wall. Like Stannis, John is named a rebel to the throne by Cersei, and when John decides to lead a wildling army down against Ramsay Bolden at Winterfell at the end of A Dance with Dragons, he becomes an actual rebel lord commander, very clearly breaking his vow not to meddle in the affairs of the realm. Then we have this passage that comes in A Storm of Swords when he's sent to kill Mance Raider, king beyond the wall, against his will. John is in the iron cage that goes up and down the wall at Castle Black in this quote. A grim day. Jon Snow wrapped gloved hands around the bars and held tight as the wind hammered at the cage once more. When he looked straight down past his feet, the ground was lost in shadow, as if he were being lowered into some bottomless pit. Well, death is a bottomless pit of sorts, he reflected, and when this day's work is done, my name will be shadowed forever. Bastard children were born from lust and lies, men said. Their nature was wanton and treacherous. Once John had meant to prove them wrong, to show his lord father that he could be as good and true a son as Rob, I made a botch of that. Rob had become a hero king. If John was remembered at all, it would be as a turncloak, an oathbreaker, and a murderer. He was glad that Lord Eddard was not alive to see his shame. Turncloak, oathbreaker, murderer, wanton and treacherous, his name forever shadowed. This may as well be Night's King we're talking about, as John is being lowered into the abyss. Don't forget the Night's King's name was supposedly erased from the record, which is why we don't have the name Azor High in Westeros, by the way. As for John's brother Rob, he's again suggested as a Brandon the Breaker, last hero type figure, being named as a hero king and a king in the north. This is in stark contrast to John, who is shamed and lowered into the abyss and all that. I'll also point out that just as Stannis emulates Night's King by warring against a king in the north and a king beyond the wall, Jon here is on his way to try to kill the king beyond the wall while thinking of his brother Rob, the king in the north, whom he kills in the dream that we just read. Right before his assassination, Jon was, of course, about to lead a force south against a different lord of Winterfell, Ramsay Bolton. 
Imposter. And of course, John actually commanded the defense of the wall against Mance Raider's initial attack. He's got these parallels covered, in other words. Since I brought up the idea of Knight's King and Brandon the Breaker being brothers, I'll go ahead and address the obvious timeline heresy question that arises from my theory crafting. Namely, if Knight's King is Azor Ahai, a dragon person from the east, then how is Knight's King also the brother of the Lord of Winterfell slash King of the North, Brandon the Breaker? Well, first of all, I'm not suggesting the Starks are also secret dragon lords. They're a couple of steps removed, basically. I do think that Brandon the Breaker was probably the last hero. The thing he broke would have been the hold of the Long Night, and perhaps he named Winterfell in memory of slaying the Winter. I suspect that what happened here is that Azor Ahai probably had children before he transformed into Night's King, and he also probably had brothers, sisters, nieces, and nephews as well. And I think it was probably one of these people who became the last hero slash Brandon the Breaker Stark. It's hard to say exactly when the name Stark came into use or when Winterfell was founded, but having already looked at all the Azor High and Night's King and Last Hero parallel figures in my older podcasts, I can tell you with fairly high confidence that the relationship between Night's King, leader of the others, and Last Hero, leader of the Night's Watch, is always suggested as a father-son, uncle-nephew, or brother-brother relationship. If it was one of these scenarios, then how Stark is either related to Night's King or even directly descended from him, and I've always believed something like that had to be the case, that the Starks are actually related to both Night's King and the Others themselves. And in fact, I did an entire podcast series about that called Blood of the Other, which is meant as a sort of opposite of Blood of the Dragon. Getting back to Jon Snow as a Night's King figure, he's looking pretty good so far. Now he just needs to wander north of the Wall and give his seed and soul to a moon-pale, icy woman, and his journey to the dark side will be complete. Ladies and gentlemen. Then Ghost emerged from between two trees, with Val beside him. They look as though they belong together. Val was clad all in white, white woolen breeches tucked into high boots of bleached white leather, White bearskin cloak pinned at the shoulder with a carved weirwood face, white tunic with bone fastenings. Her breath was white as well, but her eyes were blue, her long braid the color of dark honey, her cheeks flushed red from the cold. It had been a long while since Jon Snow had seen a sight so lovely. Have you been trying to steal my wolf? He asked her. Ah, but Jon's wolf is named Ghost, so Jon is actually asking Val if she's stealing his ghost. That's pretty much the next best thing to taking someone's soul, I would think. Knight's King spied his lovely Knight's Queen from atop the wall, while Jon is standing just in front of the wall on the north side here. But he's certainly captivated with Val's beauty as she possesses his ghost. Jon will later be accused of keeping her locked up and hidden at Castle Black, echoing Night's King taking Night's Queen back to the Night Fort and making her his queen. And along the same lines, when Stannis offers to make Jon Lord of Winterfell, marrying Val is part of the proposal, which again implies Val as Jon's potential queen and wife. Val herself makes a fantastic Winter Queen, dressed all in white with a snow bear cloak and a weirwood brooch, and those blue eyes. The scene we just quoted is Val returning from making contact with Tormund and the Wildlings. And when she leaves on this trip two weeks earlier, the Night's Queen symbolism is even more obvious. When they emerged north of the wall through a thick door made of freshly hewn green wood, the Wildling Princess paused for a moment to gaze out across the snow-covered field where King Stannis had won his battle. Beyond, the haunted forest waited, dark and silent. The light of the half-moon turned Val's honey-blonde hair a pale silver and left her cheeks as white as snow. She took a deep breath. The air tastes sweet. My tongue is too numb to tell. All I can taste is cold. Cold? Val laughed lightly. No. When it is cold, it will hurt to breathe. When the others come. All right, well, blue eyes are one thing. I mean, lots of people have blue eyes. But skin as white as snow is clear Night's Queen language. Val's also acting as if she's untroubled by the cold which makes Dolorous Ed so cold as to be numb. And she's warning them about the others, as if she knows them. Val also has no fear of the haunted forest, and is indeed able to come and go as she pleases. So she really does come across as some sort of icy queen of the north in these scenes. And she's stealing Jon's ghost. Which, by the way, is already a white shadow. <laughs> Not kidding. And this is from A Dance with Dragons. 
Ahead, he glimpsed a pale white trunk that could only be a weirwood, crowned with a head of dark red leaves. Jon Snow reached back and pulled Longclaw from his sheath. He looked to the right and left, gave Satin and Horse a nod, watched them pass it on to the men beyond. They rushed the grove together, kicking through drifts of old snow with no sound but their breathing. Ghost ran with them, a white shadow at Jon's side. Another slightly less dramatic scene in A Dance with Dragons also describes Ghost as a white shadow at his side, and a scene in A Clash of Kings describes Ghost as a pale shadow moving through the night. Although Ghost does have burning red eyes like two red suns, and not the blue star eyes of the others, this is nevertheless a little disturbing. I was kidding when I was pretending to be worried about Joffrey having white shadows all around him, but this is a little different. We do like Jon. I've always wondered about what this means, to be honest. Why George would describe Ghost with the white shadow and pale shadow language of the others. Now it makes sense though, and I actually just put this together writing the script a couple days ago. John is playing the role of a Zorahai turned Night's King, and he's giving his ghost to a Night's Queen to make white shadows. His ghost is a white shadow because a Zorahai's ghost, his seed and soul, made white shadows. This is an absolutely fabulous confirmation of our theorizing, both of the idea that Night's King made white shadows with Night's Queen, and that Night's King was a Zora High and a dragon person, just like John. Indeed, Ghost's eyes, which shone like two red suns in A Clash of Kings, reflect the fiery nature of Azorahai's seed and soul, which was then given to Night's Queen and used to create the others. And in a future video, we'll dive into how all that magical temperature conversion works, and what it means that the others were potentially fathered by a fiery dragon. Psst, it has something to do with the burning blue star eyes. Now, I'm almost skipping over the obvious things here. Naming Ghost a white shadow at John's side basically implies John as both a dragon king and a knight's king, even before Val enters into it, because the white shadow term has been applied the most to the Kingsguard and the others by far. Here's what I mean. The kings of Westeros are well known for having white shadows at their side, and Jon is a potential candidate for king of Westeros via his Targaryen blood by way of R plus L equals J. Now, if we see a white shadow at John's side and think, the others, then, well, John looks like a Night's Watch commander with an other following him around, which can really only be an image of Night's King. And that, dear friends, brings us full circle. John, like Stannis, is playing the combined role of Azor High person and Night's King person. Like Stannis, he's implied both as a Dragon King and as a symbolic father of the others. At the risk of stating the obvious, I believe that George did this because someone thought of as Azor Ahai did, in fact, become the Knight's King of Westerosi legend. From a thematic perspective, I don't think it should be too hard to accept that the, quote, hero who slew his wife to work blood magic and broke the moon in doing so turned into the villain who created the others. As most of you know, I've always thought that it was the moon breaking in the Azor Ahai myth which led to the Long Night by virtue of the cracking moon shedding moon meteors that impacted on the planetos and blotted out the sun. Thus, the man who caused the Long Night, Azor Ahai, would have become the king of the Long Night, which makes perfect sense to me. The idea of Night's King as a warrior who knew no fear also fits very well with Azor Ahai, warrior of fire, whose archetype is defined by having the courage to reach for the fire of the gods. Now, if you want the full story on how Azor Ahai, who is from Ashai, came to Westeros and eventually north to the Wall, I'll have to refer you to my smash hit Great Empire of the Dawn videos, woo, thanks guys, titled Dragon Lords of Ancient Ashai and Westeros. But suffice it to say, there is abundant evidence that Azor Ahai did just that, and that his story does end in the north, in the lands of always winter. What I'm suggesting is that at some point, he became the figure known as Night's King, the original father of the others. Only to have his stupid son or nephew or whatever come along and spoil things, the brat. The brat hero, that's what he should be called, little bastard. Wait, <laughs> wait,